Hello friends, welcome to FDR India. Let's talk to Dr. JP today about the farm sector. Hello sir. Hello Ankit. Sir, uh, farmers from Punjab, Haryana and Uttar Pradesh have been protesting in Delhi and they are uh, they seek a legal guarantee for MSP. Now, uh, we understand fundamentally they are seeking income security. So, my question to you is, if not we are MSP, how do we ensure that the incomes of farmers are secured? It's a great question, Ankit that farmers have been getting the wrong end of the stick for the past 75 years is absolutely true. Whichever be the party in power, our whole bias in the country has been in terms of policy anti-farmer. Not consciously, it's not deliberately to hurt the farmers. But because of our own socialist approach, anti-market approach, monopolist approach, government license control permitrage approach, and two, our fear of shortage of food grains in the early decades. Remember, until 1970s, 80s, we had tremendous shortage of basic foods, the cereals, the staple foods. We were living ship to mouth. So to address that again, we were very worried about it. Therefore, created many instruments and laws and mechanisms and so on and so forth. The third is, there's always a, a pro-consumer bias in politics. In a democratic society, when parties and governments have to go back to the people again and again for elections, the temptation is to always look at the consumers and ignore the producers' interests, even if you have some sympathy for them. And finally, because of the efflux of time and the sloganeering in a very socialist kind of a thing, certain taboos have become integral to our society. I'll give a couple of examples. If the global price is good, if the local price is not good enough, there's a glut in the market. World over, the governments and the farmers aggressively pursue export markets. Country gets foreign exchange, farmers get more income, you don't have to carry the, uh, the, the, the inventory charges, the go-down charges when you don't need the stock. Good for everybody, win-win-win solution. Mm -hmm. And the recipient countries also, their shortages are met instead of starving. And their prices also will stabilize. It's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. Whereas only in India, the moment you say export, there's a resistance. Right. When, for instance, looks at the moment and FDR and I have fought for export liberalization, removing the export ban on food grains in 2011, even major political leaders with experience some of them known to be reformers in the country, their instinct reaction is, my God, exports? Right. How can you have exports? The moment Ukraine war came, and the pretext that the global prices are likely, likely to rise uh, because of Ukrainian stock not being available to the global market, we used this opportunity to immediately impose a ban on um, uh, exports. And there are certain vested interests in the country. For instance, the liquor lobby in India, I am told, this mm -hmm. is new to me, they want broken rice and rice to be available in India so that they can convert that into liquor. Mm -hmm. And they don't want the market price, global market price to prevail in the country. So you can go on and on. Always, either the trader or the industry which uses agricultural produce as raw material, they have greater collective bargaining power. Though the farmers are more numerous, they are fragmented, they don't understand their self-interest, they are emotional, they are broken up in caste, region, religion, etc. And therefore, then they don't have economic uh, logic or economic literacy. Whereas the businessman is more literate economically. He or she understands what is in their best interest. So time and again you notice the policy proclivity is always for the business class or the consumers. Mm -hmm. Another example is you take the palm and oil. India is in short supply, therefore imports are necessary, there's no question about it. But global prices are very low, particularly the, from the Southeast Asia where, you know, the productivity is very high because of the climate and better practices. And our oil seed producers cannot compete with them. Now, while you import, in order to protect India's long-term interest so that we are not permanently dependent on imports, and in order to ensure that the farmers get a decent price, it is reasonable to impose a reasonable tariff, right? Mm. What did we do? On the refined oil, if they refine it already, in those countries, we imposed a very high tariff in order to protect the industry here. 
And the crude palm oil and oil, which mm. becomes a raw material for refining industry, there was practically no tariff. So farmers let them suffer mm. with unfair competition, but industry let them be protected. Until again, FDR and uh, uh, I and several other farmers' organizations, I'm sure, we all persistently argued only Narendra Modi government, after seven, eight years of intense effort, has imposed the uh, tariffs. Again, Ukraine war came mm. because, again, Ukraine is a significant supplier of the oil, cooking oil, though not permanent oil. They supply sunflower, safflower, other oils. They are significant players in the global market. Taking that as an opportunity, Government of India more or less eliminated the import duties, the novel nominal 3 or 4 percent or 5 percent. So you can see persistent bias mm. across parties over the decades. Now, what we must understand is Market is like gravity, the power of the market. What is market? Before going into specific solutions, you must understand what is the meaning of the market because many people think market is bad, market is evil. No, right. market is you and I and all the listeners and viewers and every household and every human being. What you at that point of time out of free will mm. want to buy mm. or sell. Market is the collective conscience of the country. Now, if you don't utilize the market forces and create incentives to ensure that the farmer's price holds reasonably, you try to do something which is utterly unnatural and impossible to sustain in the long term. That is what this whole MSP business is about. Mm. Temporarily, you know, when there is a glut in the market and farmers have a problem, once in a while you can do it. But to sanctify it, institutionalize it, make it permanent and deplete the treasury, bleed the taxpayer, is an absurd notion. So what you have to do is intelligently use the market forces to our advantage, to the mm. farmer's advantage, mm. without seriously undermining the country's interest and the consumer's interest. But ultimately, if the choice is there between the farmer and the consumer, consumer also must be willing to pay. Mm. If every time the farmer alone is forced to pay, as we discussed earlier, if 45% of India's uh, uh, workers are in agricultural sector and if the share of farming in the total GDP of the country, total production is declining every year. That means by definition, arithmetically, the farmer's income is relatively getting less. Mm. Not in absolute terms, but as a ratio of the rest of India, it is falling and falling and falling. Mm. Now, if one segment of society and a large segment suffers like that, it is not sustainable. It's not sustainable politically. It's not sustainable economically, it's not sustainable socially. The reason why though the farmers who are agitating are largely from Punjab, mm. one state of India. Punjab is a very important state but a relatively small state. And yet, you can see the whole nation is now agog. Mm. There is a potential political instability, there is social unrest, there is economic pain. So if you ignore the farmer's interests, if you don't create a mechanism by which on a sustainable basis, without depleting the treasury money, the farmer's price is held, we will have tremendous crisis and it will impact India's economic growth. This is not one day's problem before the elections this year. This is going to be the next decadal problem. In my judgment, it's a fundamental challenge of the next decade, how to protect the farmers. There are three or four fundamental principles. We can go into details. Principle one, always have policies and remove regulations to ensure that a fair market price is available to the farmer. That means when there is a shortage, farmer must get the price. You don't create artificial barriers. When there is a global market price is good, don't create an export barrier. So internal or external, wherever there is a possibility, allow the market to prevail to the advantage of the farmer. Mm -hmm. And we have done exactly the opposite for the past 75 years, most of the past 75 years. The second principle, sometimes we have to import. India is a net exporter of food mm -hmm. or agricultural products. But some components, India is the biggest importer, pulses and oil seeds mm -hmm. or pulses and cooking oil. You import if necessary because we can't afford to have shortages in the country. But have protection to the farmer from the uh, low-cost imports by reasonable import duty, right. whether it's oil palm, or something else. You look at right now what's happening in Europe. What is the issue there? 
because Ukrainian exports, they could not go via the Black Sea because of the war situation there. They all dumped it by land route into Europe, mm. notably the neighboring country, Poland, and other countries too. Now, European prices have crashed. Okay, these are small countries, relatively speaking by Indian standards. If there is a 10-20 million extra ton supply, then there's a glut in the mm. market. And because their ports are not able to handle the export infrastructure as well, because Europe is never a big food exporter, not food grain exporter. Right. So suddenly you want to export 10 or 20 million tons, you don't have the port handling capacity. Mm. So they don't know what to do. So Europe is no, European farmers are now on a war path. What are they saying? Don't allow the import of Ukraine so liberally. Impose a tariff and do something. Despite the fact that Europe is totally committed to Ukraine in this war with Russia. Mm. So that's a rational approach. So you must make sure that there is protection from the low-cost imports, particularly of the major foods in the country, which is good for the country, protection, good for the farmers. Then next, even if the market is uh, not regulated by the government to the detriment of the farmer, agriculture always sees volatility. Mm. Therefore, the second thing is, what do you do with non-perishable commodities volatility? This is relatively easy. First, we'll come to that. Rice and wheat don't see such volatility. The normal market mechanisms will work within the country and exports. But you take cotton, you take chili, you take turmeric and some other products which can be stored directly as they are or after some minimal processing like, you know, turmeric, you have to cook it and then store it. Chili, you have to dry it and store it. Cotton, you only have to gin it and then store it. Nothing much more is required. If you have the storage capacity to withstand the market vagaries when there is price is low, we can't overnight increase the price. Now, what is happening typically? The farmer is always in distress because farmers are generally poor. Mm. And therefore, unless the crop I produced, I can sell very quickly. I will not be able to survive at home. There is not enough for me to eat and survive. And to raise the next crop, I have to invest again some capital. Mm. I don't have money. So perpetually, farmer is in this cycle of distress. Even if the price is low, knowing full well that after three months or six months, the price may actually be better for him, he has no staying power. Now, here stock is available. This is a classic case where storage and then credit available. In India, no more than 3 to 4 percent of storage capacity is there. And you could do the statistics, the pledge loans, you know, taking the stock, hypothecating the stock and then giving credit so that the farmer has staying power. Out of the total agricultural credit, it is a very minuscule percentage. It's a shame. It's a shame. Year after year, cotton prices of runtime will be very high. Mm -hmm. Next, they'll be very low. When they're low, farmer is forced to sell. When they're high, the trader who is smart and who, who bought it is benefiting. I don't blame the trader. Mm. If you are smart and if you take advantage of the market conditions and you make an honest profit, there's nothing illegal or criminal about it. It's not the trader who is guilty. It is the Indian government and the banking sector that are guilty. Because you have not created the storage capacity for the farmer to be able to hold on to the stock. You have not given the credit for the farmer not to indulge in distress sale. This is the low-hanging fruit. And banks have no risk at all because the stock is there. Mm. Unless you're all colluding and then you're corrupt. The stock is there. You're giving money only on the stock there. It's as good as money with you. And yet, this simple thing we did not do. It's criminal in my opinion. It can be made very much part of your 18% or whatever priority sector lending mm. and make it mandatory and push more money in that direction. Then perishable commodities. Even today, a data scientist came and uh, gave me a presentation. As far as practicable, let there be greater understanding of the market demand and supply. It's difficult. You know, for instance, you take the United States and other countries. The agricultural department, the federal department, they release reports about certain commodities, like for instance, orange. Mm. What is the likely scenario? How much is the production likely to be? What are the conditions? Not only in the United States, but in other countries which are supplying habitually to the United States. And what is the price likely to be? And that becomes very important in the futures trading, mm. the whole stock market and the businesses, food processing industry, they all respond to that. We have no market intelligence. 
we can actually improve the market intelligence even in perishable commodities by simple mechanisms. Right. In this day of technology, it's not difficult. You can see how much of seed is taken by the farmers in a particular year during the season of say perishable commodities like a, a tomato, etc. At least where the hybrid seeds are involved, when farmer does not recycle the seeds, etc. So government can do a lot by simply improving the market intelligence with very reliable data on the basis of which farmers can make informed decisions. Mm. But even if you make informed decisions, you can never be sure about perishable commodities, uh, demand supply uh, mismatch. Because by the very nature, sometimes production is good, sometimes production is very low. Uh, you can't anticipate conditions. And market demand dramatically varies and the price fluctuates wildly. If there is a 10% shortage, the price goes up by 200, 300, 500%. If there is a 10% glut, the price falls fivefold and tenfold. It doesn't fall proportionate to the supply and demand in perishable commodities because you don't know what to do with the surplus. Sure. And therefore, processing. Take tomato. It is a perishable commodity everywhere in the world. Whether it's America or Europe or Australia, tomato is tomato, right? Mm. Except they are a little colder than us most of the year. But otherwise, tomato is perishable. Why is it that there is no price fluctuation in tomato in, in uh, Europe and America and Australia? Whenever the price is low and there is a glut in the market, there is such a mature and efficient and very large processing industry. It all goes to a processing industry at a reasonable price. It may not be a fantastic price, but it's a comfortable price for the farmer. Mm. There is no need to go in for distress sale. Then they process this and keep the processed foods ready. While they will be generally sold throughout the year, whenever there is a shortage and they, therefore the price is going up, then the processed foods are coming into the market a little more. What is happening then? The farmer is guaranteed a reasonable price throughout the year. Mm. And the consumer don't, doesn't have to pay exorbitant prices when there is a shortage. Both are protected. And how much processing is going on in our horticulture in India? Many estimates show it's about 3 to 4 percent. Rest of the world, they do 15, 20, 30 percent. And what is happening to the farmer? See the multiple losses. Because of inadequate storage and processing, an estimated 30% or more of the perishable agricultural products are getting destroyed. Mother Earth is giving us, farmer is working hard, investing money and producing it. Nobody is utilizing it is going waste. That means 30% of the money is down the drain. Farmer is losing, the country is losing. Other countries don't have this problem. Second, because the price volatility farmer is suffering dramatically. The kind of losses they suffer on account of uh, this volatility of the perishable commodities is phenomenal. We know very well about, uh, for instance, onion. Mm. Onion is politically the most significant crop in India. Mm. The Janata government's collapse in 1980 was attributed to onion prices. Then 2004, I remember 2003-2004 election in uh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and uh, Chhattisgarh, etc. It was decided by the onion prices again. Mm. So onion is politically very important. Governments are very nervous. When Modi government came to office in 2014, I remember one of the first decisions they've taken is, not deliberately, but as part of the normal culture, a decision that to help the consumer, but the farmer suffered. The onion prices were ruling high at that time because there were shortages. Now, instead of allowing the market to play out, and if necessary, import, I have no quarrel. Mm. If there is a real shortage in the country, import. But instead, they tried to crush the price in the country by organizing raids, by discouraging the traders, they put the fear of God into them. Within a month or two, the prices collapsed. When they became three rupees a kilogram, nobody bothered. Mm. It was not even a discussion in the newspapers or in the assemblies and parliaments. This simply is not right. We have to create a stable structure. So there are a variety of ways, and finally, Many commodities, what is happening in India has a long market chain. Hmm. The farmer sells to a commission agent. Oftentimes, he is the one who lends money. Hmm. Therefore, he has the bargaining power. You can't dare to say, you, can, you cannot say, say no to him. You have to agree to whatever he offers. Otherwise, next time money will not be there. When crisis is there, there is nobody to support you or sustain you. The trade system is very weak in the country even today. Then he sells to somebody else, the somebody sells to somebody else. Mm. And the higher it goes in this chain, they have greater and greater market intelligence and market power. Right. 
Now, finally, after six um, links in the chain, it goes to the consumer. Typically, a farmer in this case gets about 25 to 30 percent of the end price of the consumer. Mm. Now, some amount of markup is inevitable in the market, but in India, it's absurdly high. Supposing you compress the market chain, you have retail chains. Mm. What happens in retail chains? They do all the things together. There's only one intermediary, farmer to retail chain, they procure and then they have their own retail outlets and they sell to the consumer. Right. They do everything in between. They do grading, mm. packaging, transport, storage, processing, retailing. And because their market power and global reach, they also open up export markets. It's a win-win for everybody. Mm. Typically, whenever there are strong retail chains, if the end price of the, the consumer is 100 rupees, the farmer gets about 60 rupees, as opposed to 25, 30 earlier. So without doing a thing, by simply improving the market conditions, the farmer's income is rising significantly. Now intermediaries, they'll be employed by retail chains in some other manner. In any change in the system, the traditional players sometimes get less income. But if you want to help a few intermediaries survive, at very abysmal levels, it's not that they are getting a lot of money. The, the people who are selling with a push cart or a head load, they're not making lots of money. They're making tiny amounts of money. They can be protected otherwise. In the guise of these mom and pop stores or small traders, you're guaranteeing that the market chain is not compressed. Mm -hmm. Manmohan Singh government it brought in this retail chain policy after a great deal of effort. Finally, it was enacted. It was uh, allowed. But we didn't really allow it to operate. Because even the current BJP government, while it is generally pro-market, in this case, they did not act in a pro-market manner. Because they were concerned about the small traders. And some organizations such as Desi Jagar and Manch, they are opposed to it without any serious economic logic. It's just a traditional prejudice, etc. So the government did not push it. We lost a great opportunity. And apart from improving the farmer's price, retail chains have two great advantages. They will bring in enormous investment because our logistics we talked about storage. Mm. We talked about processing. We simply don't have it. And to pretend that the government will be able to do in the next three years or five years after failing to do in 75 years is a little absurd. Mm. Private investment must come. Why will they come? Mm. There is no money in it in the short term. But they have deep pockets. India is a growing economy. Once they invest today, they can wait for 10, 15 years. As the economy grows, the real estate, because they have now the retail stores, and India's greater ability to, uh, to, to afford the high quality products, high value products. And most important of all, they will open up the export markets. Because if you want to export, even when there is a glut in the country and you have a price advantage, there are so many non-tariff barriers. They call phytosanitary measures. Right. Other countries, you know, they're very clever. They protect their farmers, partly out of genuine concern for their health, pesticide residue, this, that, etc. Partly use that as an opportunity to prevent real competition to their farmers. Mm. They are smart. They want to protect their farmers. We are not smart. We are hurting our farmers. And only the big market chains with global experience and knowledge, they can counter that because they know how to produce to meet those standards, how to penetrate those markets. Right now, India, as I said, is actually generating a trade surplus in agricultural commodities, but a $10, $15 billion surplus. We are exporting maybe 25 to $30 billion. But one commodity alone, that is your cooking oil, our import bill is about 15 to 18 billion dollars. Now, if export markets are opened up, given India's potential, we can probably have at least a hundred billion dollar global exports. Hundred billion dollar. Because remember, India has one eighth of the total agricultural land in the country. 11 to 12 percent of the total agricultural land in the country. We are not a big country geographically. Mm. We are the fifth largest country, but we are only about 2.5 percent of the global land mass. But because 50 percent of all this land is put to agriculture, a little over 50 percent, no other big country has 50 percent land under agriculture. America and India, we are the number one, number two in any given year in terms of cropped area. China, which is three times as big as India in terms of geographic area, is 40 percent less in terms of agricultural land. And we have very good climate. Around the year, warm climate and stuff, these cold winters and snow and uh, uh, ice cold temperatures. And we have reasonable good rainfall and good soils. We have great advantages if we leverage them. So export markets will be opened up. So unless we look at it in a combined way, there's no one silver bullet. 
Right. It varies from commodity to commodity. It varies from the comparative advantage that we enjoy as opposed to other countries. It varies with the global marketing conditions. But you know, say, there are basic principles. If you adopt them, 95 out of 100, you can solve the problems. In addition to these, and this is where non-agricultural component comes, the big challenge to the farmers is the increasing cost of education and health care. Mm -hmm. 40, 50 years ago, farmers were probably even poorer than today. But they did not feel the pinch this much because they were not spending money on education and health care. If children got some education in village school, it's okay. If they didn't get it, it's okay. It was a normal thing. There is a local way that somebody would give you some, some kind of a medical treatment. If you are lucky, you survive. If you are not lucky, you will suffer. Sometimes people die. But it's okay. It's normal. Mortality rates were high. Whereas now, we all want to take care of our families and our children. The cost of education, cost of health care is skyrocketing for the farmers and for the poor. Why? Because the government has spectacularly failed mm. to provide quality education at school level and quality health care without out-of-pocket expenditure. And the burden is disproportionately felt by the poor and by the rural community. So what is common between poor and rural? Farmers. Mm. They are both poor and rural. Mm. Now, unless you address that, there will be increasing pain. It's not merely agricultural. It is rural economic pain because of governance failure. So you cannot pretend it's merely agriculture alone. If that burden is reduced, I guarantee you, both the burden on the poor in the country at large and the farmers in the rural areas of India will be substantially reduced. There is a third issue. 45% of India's workforce is still in agriculture. There is no significant country on earth which has anything comparable to this. China, which is closest to us among big economies, about 15 to 18% in agriculture. And it's decreasing very rapidly. United States, it's about 2 to 3%. Europe, large parts of Europe, 1%. Mm. All the European farmers' agitations are 1% population. 1% workers. You take Southeast Asia, they're at 15, 20%. We alone have this 45% even now. We have to provide non-farm employment. That cannot happen with the existing village structure. Beyond a point, we cannot do it because there is no country on earth which could take care of the infrastructure requirements for 600,000 villages and probably 1.5 million habitats. A village is a legal definition. If you actually take the places where people live, there are probably 1.5 million, 15 lakhs of them. Many of them we call hamlets. Unless you promote in-situ urbanization, local urbanization, not to go to distant big cities, leading precarious lives without any skills or support system, but locally with low skills, area you understand, very close to your own natural habitat, your village, with all the support system of the family, of the near and dear ones, and relatively low cost of living. If you create quality urban amenities, and today television is available everywhere, mm. mobile phone is available everywhere, power system and power sector is improving, which is terrible compared to the rest of the world, but definitely access to power electricity is much better today in the, in the country. So we are quite close to it. If only government identifies these small towns and makes them economic hubs by building infrastructure, transport in particular, roads and transport, some basic amenities, education, health care, and encourage housing in private sector. And whatever support you can give for the poor, you can give in the housing programs. In the current budget, they provide a significant amount. What will happen is, over time, there will be a natural migration to these small towns instead of to big cities. Mm. And jobs will be created low skills, not far from their habitat. Agriculture and non-agriculture economy will be integrated. Now, everything that's happening is, at the cost of agricultural economy, whereas you have to actually find synergies between the two. Once you do that, small jobs will be created. Very high-skilled people will still go to big cities, so be it. Mm. But 80% of the people who will be employed from agriculture to non-agriculture, unorganized to organized, will be the small skills. And that's necessary wherever there are people. You don't have to go to Mumbai or Delhi. Aren't there people outside Mumbai and Delhi? Don't they need services? So, Three bigger issues, agriculture, education, healthcare, small town development as economic hubs so that you can 
slowly shift population to non-agricultural economy. Within agriculture, market principles judiciously applied to suit our conditions. Unless we have the overall architecture, we will not be able to address this monumental challenge to India's future. Because you now, most of our responses are ad hoc. Mm. That day, all right, farmers are agitating, there's a problem. These, these demands are very unreasonable. There's no question about it. But the problem is real. Hmm. Supposing the agitation is now contained for the time being, there's no immediate political fallout. If you pretend everything is over and wait for the next uh, uh, cataclysmic event or the next uh, eruption, that's not very smart management. You have to have a strategy, a long-term strategy, a 10-15 year strategy and systematically implement it. Start with go-downs immediately. Start with pledge rolls immediately. Start with import um, tariffs where required. Start with export promotion where feasible. Start with retail chains, already policies in place. So there are many things we can do. Hmm. And education, healthcare may take time, but have a program. Improve the quality of outcomes so that the people don't have to go out of pocket. And promote small town development. And these have many externalities. It will actually improve Indian economy, overall create many jobs. So you have to have a long-term strategy, coherent strategy, duly take into account the rural economy and agriculture. Then we'll find a solution. It's not easy. Mm. If anybody pretends there are instant solutions, mm. they're completely wrong. It's a monumental challenge of India. It's an unprecedented problem in global history. China is the only country which came somewhat close to accomplishing something there, but China is an authoritarian country. So in a democratic setup, without coercion, how do we create conditions where the migration from agriculture to non-agriculture, higher incomes in agriculture, and better quality of life for everybody? And that's the way we should look at it. Right. And I think this, this crisis could be a great opportunity. Hmm. I mean, look at education, healthcare, the collapse in the country. We are pretending it doesn't exist. Take advantage now. Look at these things and give satisfaction to people. Right. So, uh, I don't know if it is the right question, but uh, why are farmers only from Punjab, Haryana and UP protesting? Why aren't there any protests from other, other states? My reading, apart from politics, opposition parties, people are inimical to a government in Delhi, mm. uh, others, you know, they want to use the, the publicity that is generated in a highly centralized country around the national capital. Mm. And even in other sectors, for instance, when the Gujjas versus Minas reservation thing was happening in mm. Rajasthan, the first objective of those people is the national capital region paralyze it. Right. Because the whole nation is agog. Mm. Whereas if it happens in Bengaluru or Pune or uh, even Mumbai, it doesn't have the same appeal for the media because our Indian media, Indian middle class are obsessed with the national capital. Mm. That apart, in India, habitually, irrespective of the issue, if the government says something, opposition has to say no. Mm. We are polar opposites. Therefore, take advantage, irrespective of the merits of the situation. You do altogether different things when you are in power. Mm. But in opposition, you say something outrageous, reckless, irresponsible, irrational, impossible. That's become the mantra of Indian politics. Mm -hmm. But apart from this, there are local conditions. The most important condition, particularly in so far as Punjab and Haryana is concerned, is way back in Pratap Singh Kairan's time, immediately after the independence, they had Kairan as chief minister, a very wise man, though he was vilified and then he was sacked. Uh, in terms of governance, one of the most competent people and far-sighted people. And there was a minister called Sir Chautu Ram, agriculture and marketing minister. Among other things, they did remarkable work in terms of creating drainage, consolidation of lands, road infrastructure and electricity, and of course, uh, irrigation. These five things, they made it a mantra for every single village. Mm. But in addition to enhancing productivity like that, they looked at the marketing. Mm. They created what is called the Mandi Act. Right. Basically, Agricultural Marketing Act, mm. which became a template for the rest of India. But the only place where they were very well implemented to the benefit of the farmers was in Punjab, Haryana. Mm. Undivided Punjab. Mm. I remember going there, many of us officers, young probationers, to Punjab, Haryana, to a part of our rural training. The remarkable vibrancy of the Mandis. The best customers are in the Mandis. The best leaders respected in the community locally are the Mandi leaders, mm. Mandi chairman and others. So, as officers, the guest houses in which we stayed were the Mandi guest houses. So, they were very effective in a particular regime. Right. When there was a monopoly, when there was socialist credo dominating, within that, they created a transparent mechanism 
for the farmers to sell in a very effective way and give them confidence. It worked very well. Hmm. Now, the Mandi leaders, they are very influential politically also. In terms of social hierarchy also, they all happen to be the, the very progressive and effective, very strong agrarian communities like Jats. Hmm. They know how to organize very well. The farm laws, the three farm laws I maintained repeatedly, they were extremely good pro farmer laws. Hmm. Because the Mandi leadership was affected, the monopoly was taken away. Mm. Earlier, you had to only sell in the Mandi. Mm. Even if informally you sell elsewhere, you still have to pay a fee to the Mandi, mm. the market says. That was sought to be removed by one of the farm laws. Mm. The Mandi leaders felt threatened. Therefore, they could easily mobilize farmers because they had influence locally. And farmers worked to their disadvantage. The farmers' agitation at that time was essentially anti-farmer. Right. Because every one of the three laws is actually to enhance the price advantage of the farmer, to enhance the market competitiveness of the farmer. It's a very strange case where the people agitated against their own self-interest mm. because their leaders had such sway over them. And they were tried and tested leaders. Once you created a framework and a certain mood, then the political and the, this economic compulsion meant that the same purpose is carried, the right. same approach is carried. The second thing that happened is, in those parts, you know, wheat is the main crop that was grown. First mm. agricultural revolution was in wheat, right. then came to rice. Mm. Now, wheat is necessarily in India, given Indian climatic conditions, a rabi crop. Mm. It's a second crop, what we call second crop in the rest of the country. Mm. Whereas the monsoon crop is rice. Mm. Rice doesn't require such low temperatures. Right. So farmers in uh, Punjab, Haryana and Western UP, that's where Western UP comes in, they discovered because they have very fertile lands, plenty of irrigation, etc. Discovered that the first crop, if they raise rice and if they sell to the government because there is no local buyer, mm. they are not rice eating rice areas, mm. the staple food is not rice. Therefore, the basic market is the government. And in those days, government is procuring. Mm. And government is procuring at a and increasingly, the price became better and better. Mm. And the quality of rice produced for procurement in these parts of the country and even in other parts, even in Godavari districts, mm. which are the rice belt of Andhra Pradesh, the rice produced is not eaten by the people mostly. People eat only the fine rice. Mm -hmm. Rice produced in Godavari districts, for instance, is the crude rice, mm. 1061 and other varieties. So essentially, it's going for the government procurement. So government procurement of a crop which is relatively easy and safe has become the norm. And the fear, therefore, is if the government reduces the procurement, because this cannot be marketed. Mm. In a, in most of Indians don't eat it. They eat only certain varieties. They eat malakalukulu, mm. they eat sannalu, they eat BPT, etc. But they don't eat 1061. They don't eat some other uh, common varieties of rice. Mm. So for them, procurement became a very big issue. Right. And they're not looking at the larger picture about mm. demand and supply that there's a glut in the market, we're eating less and less of food grains, we are diversifying our food items, we're eating more and more fruits, vegetables, milk, meat and fresh, uh, fish. That's the way it should be. That's not, uh, farmer doesn't think of that. Mm. Farmer is only worried, I'm producing it, this is easy for me, I'm habituated to this. Now, some, uh, perchance tomorrow somebody is not buying it at a good price, what will happen? Mm. On top of it, what happened is Dr. Manmohan Singh's time with good intentions, there is something very unwise in the long term. These crude varieties, which are not very much in the marketable within the country, they increased the procurement price to a level where the official price of purchase by the government, minimum support price, exceeded the market, market price. price. Mm -hmm. Earlier, habitually, the market price was always greater. There was coercive procurement. Mm -hmm. You're forcing the farmer to sell to the government. Now, in the last 15 years or so, or 20 years, the farmer is now forcing the government to buy. Mm. It's a complete reversal of the trading terms. And therefore, the fear is that if MSP is gone, who will buy this? Whereas in southern parts, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, etc., though they produce massive quantities of rice, mostly local consumption is there, only the crude variety of rice that is sold to the government, though some of those farmers are concerned, mm. but most other farmers they know that their rice is marketable. They actually are not supplying to government. Right. So there are local specific factors. That's why 
this is not a farmers moment of india hmm. if farmers moment of india is there there would have been much deeper appreciation of the complexity of indian requirements and they would have looked at the issues and this is not one of these farmers argued none, none of the demands is about protection from undue imports hmm. it's an amazing thing that's a government policy by the stroke of the pen government is denying the income to the farmers not one of the demands they are not rational the demands they are not understanding the market conditions not one of the demands is remove the export ban have you said it they said remove don't go go into wto, WTO yeah. remove the free trade agreements mm. and do all the basically they want to be the indian cabinet so the farmers distress is genuine mm. but the farmers response is irrational and impossible market is like gravity wise people don't defy gravity mm. they use gravity to their advantage if you want to defy gravity it will always fall inevitably and the the greater the defiance of gravity the bigger the crash eventually right because the price will be paid by the whole society and the indian economy once in a while whenever there is a distress we can do things which are anti market but that's not sustainable hmm. these are one off operations when there is distress ultimately you have to use market conditions to your advantage with appropriate tricks right thank you sir for giving such a, a well rounded picture of the farm sector